You might like Disney, but I guarantee not to the extent of my next guest. Learn how his years of studying Walt has made him better at building products. What's up, my friends? Thanks for coming back and joining me for another episode of Design Today, episode 85. I'm your host, Dylan Winspear, and before we get into the interview today, I want to say thanks for all the messages I received this last week. As I posted some pictures to the Design Today Instagram account of my 10-year anniversary with my wife in Zion National Park, it was dope, and if you've never been there, put it on your bucket list. Thank you for the messages. Prior to taking that week off, and again this week, I've been able to do a handful of coaching session, sessions with you, the listeners. I love these sessions. We've talked about everything from soft skills to resumes and portfolio reviews to career moves and career strategy, even down to a few things that felt more like therapy than anything else, and that's okay. Now, I've got a birthday coming up at the beginning of September, and I wanna give you all a gift from me. From now through the entire month of September, any coaching session booked using the promo code BDAYGIFT will receive 25% off the coaching session. I've not run any specials on this coaching session option since I started the coaching sessions. So take advantage of this while you can. There's only a few slots that are open every week and many of them are filled over the next couple of weeks. So jump on this and schedule them soon. I hope to see you then. My guest today is Adam Landefeld. He's the SVP of product where I work at Domo. I've worked with him for four years and have enjoyed our conversations a ton. He's also a huge Disney fan. And I mean like huge Disney fan. A few months back, we were exchanging some text messages and he was talking a bit about some of the cool themes and principles that he's learned while studying Walt and the Disney Imagineers. It stirred up an idea where I needed to have him come on the podcast and share how he's been able to become a better product leader and a builder of product by studying Walt and the Imagineers. This was easy to get him to agree to. So let's jump into this week's episode featuring Adam Landefeld. Uh, an opportunity to uh, come and do this. This is pretty fun, especially in a pandemic time. So thank you very much. Absolutely. I've been looking forward to it. <laughs> an opportunity to talk face to face with somebody. With again. a human. Uh -huh. Yeah. With a real human. Yep. Here we are. Uh, our topic of conversation today is something that uh, I think you even wore a shirt to, to get us ready for it. Did you do that on purpose? I just always am wearing one like this. Are you are always wearing a Disney shirt? Yeah, I think I think I've gone like a consecutive ninety days. <laughs> <laughs> so that wasn't intentional. No. Okay, well we are going to start talking a little bit about uh, Disney, and uh, we'll talk. Uh, we'll get into why we're talking Disney. But before we do that, I want you to introduce yourself and give a little bit of background on how you got to where you're at today as a, a senior vice president of product at Domo. What is your journey in a two minute nutshell? Oh, two minutes. Well, or four, don't matter. <laughs> so, my name is Adam Landefeld. I'm SVP of product for Domo. Um, I have quite an interesting journey. Um, I always thought I was going to be a designer, I always thought that was my track. Um, I didn't know that. I, I went to design school. That was, that was my college education. It wasn't CS. And so, I I came out of design school before we had sort of this renaissance of UXD. Uh -huh. um, so I came out when designers were still commoditized mm -hmm. and they were still like the necessary evil. And <laughs> I just I discovered that I wasn't super marketable. Um, I had, you know, I, was, I came from a high school um, sort of background of winning several national art contests with my pen and ink. And what? Um, yeah. So. I kind of came out of that, got a scholarship for two years at the Art Institute in San Fernando, um, off a national art con contest that was put off put on by the VFW of all places, uh -huh. um, and you know, kind of came out and realized, whoa, like I am, I'm, I'm starving to death. Like I have no <laughs> money, and I'm taking jobs like designing T-shirts, and I'm doing like all kinds of like just crazy off the wall. If you ever bought one of those two for one discount cards and saw the like school artwork on it, uh -huh. I was doing the school artwork on those cards at one point, <laughs> and so um, it was fun. Like it, it really taught me a lot of. I learned more about business during those days than I did about mm -hmm. maximizing my design capabilities. Um, but you know, somewhere in there, I worked at a at a design shop where the owner of it came in one day and said, "I've heard about this thing called the internet. Does anybody know anything about the internet?" And I was like, "Well." Mac Mall had this insert that's three pages long that talked about HTML. And he was like, great, you're the internet expert. And I was like, okay, 
Okay. Well, I'm not sure where this is going. Uh -huh. That was like 95. Um, and so I kind of started this journey of teaching myself programming, which wasn't new. I was the kid when you know, when you're in like junior high, I was the kid who, when everybody else was out in the summer playing sports, I signed up for summer school to learn how to program. Like, because the school had a computer and it was the only computer in Utah County. Yeah. And I wanted access to it. So I'd sign up for summer school. So it wasn't weird that I would go there, but I just got on a track where I was like, you know what? It's just as creative as painting and drawing, coding software. Like it's just as creative. And it started to become this creative outlet for me to start learning how to and building software applications. And so it was probably only a two year journey from when I was a dyed in the wool designer to an on the line code writer writing Java for wow. a software shop, right? Wow. And so um, that was kind of what started me on this journey. Yeah. And then during the course of that, what I found is that I was always that engineer that all of the business people hated because I would question everything. I would say, <laughs> why do you want me to build that? I don't see any value in that. I don't think it's gonna help anybody. I think I understand what the customer actually needs better. So I kind of ended up on this journey where, you know, a little coerced, a little bit forced, a little bit like people just like, get out of our hair. Um, they start pushing, you know, I started getting more and more opportunities to lead the product vision. Mm -hmm. And that really got me to a spot where I started having a lot of fun. And then uh, from there, in the middle of all that, I decided at a software company that I was at called Corda, we had a great product, but nobody, it was really technical, really complicated. We had lots of power, but we didn't really have anybody helping the customers be successful with it. So I went to the CEO and I said, hey, we really need somebody to actually help customers use this software. Um, sure. What do you think? And he kind of looked at me and said, how many people do you think you would need? And I was like, I wasn't volunteering. <laughs> I just was pointing it out. Like, you should do this. And that became an opportunity, opportunity for me to work directly with customers which was like the missing piece for me. So yeah. I went out in the world, started meeting with customers, worked with Apple, worked with Bank of America, worked with some of the biggest companies and learned how to decode what they wanted, learned how to be empathetic and to understand what it was that they were trying to do. And that kind of became the final piece where everything kind of clicked. And I began my, that's kind of when I really went after product management. Huh. And right about the same time was when kind of Josh came in bought Corda, um, and I started working for Josh, and he looked at me and he said, you're not a CS guy, you're a product guy. Like, oh, and he like, loved that. Yeah, and he was like, why aren't you over here? And so he kind of like coerced me back, you know, out of CS, out of working directly with customers, back into just core product vision, and that's where my journey's been since. Sure. But my journey, it works because of all that background. Yeah. It works because of my time as a designer. It works because of my time as a leader of consulting services. Yeah. Um, I kind of feel bad for people in product orgs that don't have those backgrounds because I look at them and I go, how do you understand the customer? How do you put yourself in their shoes? Mm -hmm. How do you be a champion of their cause? Because it's tough. I, like, it's almost unfathomable for me right. that you could get that experience right. unless you've had that experience. So right. um, that's kind of the, the that's, journey. That's crazy. So what was your title when you were at Corda? Um, senior software engineer. Okay. Then vice president of consulting services. Okay. And it was vice president of consulting services when we sold when, the company. Did you and Josh click right away? No. You didn't? No. What was that relationship or that dynamic like? Super rocky. <laughs> um, super rocky, actually. Um, and it was, so it was. The only, I, I should preface it. The reason I, I asked that question, because obviously you guys get along well now. You guys are yeah. able to get in the same room, collaborate. And, oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, you guys can obviously bounce ideas really well. So it's, it's interesting that you say rocky. Yeah. Um, so there was a little bit of he doesn't know me. I don't know him. Mm -hmm. There was a little bit of my hubris. So here I'd been on this like upward track, you know, where everything I did kind of worked well for me. I'd had so much great experience. I'd had so much success. I'd had fun. I felt like I was building my brand. I was understanding what I wanted to do. And then here comes the CEO that I've never heard that much about other than you probably won't like him. That's mm -hmm. what, that's what had been told to mm -hmm. me. And so he comes in and he's just as passionate. He's just as hands-on. He is just as eager to point out something that he believes is wrong as I am. Like, yep. So like, that's just like two alphas in the uh. room. <laughs> and clearly he's the CEO. So guess which alpha gets to win. Yep. Um, 
and I actually had to get over my hubris of I for so long felt like I can I'm going to be able to be the smartest person in the room on these topics um, because I have, have I have the depth I have the experience, and he came in and showed me that there could be another guy who also was the smartest guy in the room. <laughs> and um, so all of our rocky parts were the parts where I would just straight up challenge him and yep. he would push back and say, no, 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 no. Like, don't challenge me that way because like I am, I'm here too. Like yeah. it, it was never, it was never demeaning, never anything like that. It was just, you know, he wouldn't let me put him in his place. Sure. And I don't imagine you guys were ever like, you know, pinned against each other, like hating each other. I, I imagine yeah. you always kept it professional because that's just, I, I know how you guys would keep it. But how long do you think it took before you guys realized that, like, okay, we know how to work together now? Um, I don't know. It took it took about a year actually for us to get there, and it really kind of there's this there was this point when we were in this conference room, and it's kind of like the old you know kind of like the early days of him buying Corda, uh-huh. and it's like all the Corda old guard in the room, so yep. to speak, like all the people that have been running Corda, and I'm in the room with him, and I straight up challenged him on something. I was like, I don't. I don't agree with that. And he was like, oh, really? You know, <laughs> like, so there we are in front of everybody, kind of going back and forth at each other. And um, for me, it got, for me, it was personal. I was like, oh, how dare you, you know, insult my intelligence. And for him, he was just like, no, let's be clear about this. Like, that's what I learned later. Yep. But in my mind, I was like, no, this is, this is survival right now, man. <laughs> well, we leave that meeting and here's how much, it was a one-sided thing that I learned later. Um, and he'll tell you this. He comes into my office. He's like, you want to go to lunch? And I was like, lunch? Why would I want to go to lunch with you? I like, hate you. <laughs> <laughs> like, we were just, like, you were just telling me yeah. that I wasn't very smart. Um, and he was like, I was like, well, the meeting. And he was like, the meet? What? Like, and he was, like, baffled. Like, couldn't understand why, why I was wired up about it. And uh, he's like, that was just us getting to the best solution. And I was like, "All right, <laughs> let's go to lunch." And it kind of, it kind of ticked from there. Like, like, and so I will say, he had to put some investment in it to kind of get it across yeah. the line because I was, you know, I was the one having a hard time. That's funny. I think there could be a whole podcast about like Domo history stories. I think that'd be really interesting and entertaining, at least for me. Uh, that's not what we're here to talk about, but that's extremely funny. I did not know that you came from a design background, but. Now that you describe some of these things and the different skill sets you've been able to learn over the years, it makes a lot of sense why you're in the position that you're in and why you've always been able to give the feedback that you've been able to give. It's mm-hmm. never come across as uh, misinformed. Oh. And I think that's one of the things that all the designers appreciate is that I, you're obviously very familiar with the product. You're very familiar with the nuts and bolts of it. Um, and that's always been appreciated when we're given the feedback. Mm-hmm. And so... Uh, now I know why you've had experience with a lot of different things in that journey. So that's really cool. Um, it took me all of maybe the first week at Domo to realize that you were a Disney fan. And, uh, I think it probably happened the first time I walked into your office and saw a four foot tall Darth Vader and then a shelf of all this other memorabilia that you've got in there. Um, and you know what? The first thing that I thought was like, Hey, cool. I like Disney. Here's something that we can connect on. It wasn't until later that I said, we like Disney, but we like Disney on completely different levels. <laughs> and the level in which you like Disney is at a level I've never met. And uh, I want you to speak to it because, well, there's a fun topic that we can get into here in a second. But tell me where your love for Disney started and what you've been doing over the last few years because of this love for Disney. Yeah, yeah. Um... Yes, definitely a love for Disney. There, and it and it reaches lots of different levels. So for me, originally it was a uh, I love the cartoons. So as a kid, okay, you know, as a kid, um, ten, you know, eight, nine, ten years old, uh, I remember there was only one show that I would never miss on the television, mm-hmm. and that was the reruns of Walt Disney's Wonderful World of Color mm-hmm. that they would rerun on Sunday after Sunday evenings, and For some reason, I just, that was like seeing the most amazing person in the world describe the most amazing topics in the world. And I thought, how amazing is that life that that's what you get to do when you wake up Mm -hmm. 
And when you work all day and when you get done at the end of the day, that's what you've accomplished is you've built things like Disneyland and you've made cartoons and you've, you know, and, you know, it, if you remember the show or are familiar with the show, yeah. there's a lot of education yeah. to it as well. Like a lot of things, like that was the one thing I loved about Walt Disney is he was, he was very much a pull the curtain away and show you what's behind it. Mm-hmm. Like he, there was no, he found just as much enjoyment teaching you how they accomplished something yeah. as he did doing it. Yep. And um, so there's a lot of people that I think, you know, really just focus on the commercial aspect of Disney. And I, there certainly is a lot of that, but I kind of always am attached to that original vision of yeah. this guy who is just like the world is here for us to um kind of maximize and use it to to create better experiences for people and create better um, yeah. stories to tell and create you know let me interrupt how old were you at that time so this this would be ten, nine ten years old okay. right you know so yeah um Magical time. Yeah. It was a time where I was just and that that and that was where I decided I would be an artist. Yeah. Like I like I will be an artist so that I can go work at a place like that. Yeah. And what I what I thought at that point is there must be other places like that. I didn't realize how truly unique mm. it was. I also didn't know that he was dead. <laughs> like so here's here's me only being able to capture these reruns of shows in my you know little bubble of a world here in Utah. I didn't even realize he had passed away in 1966. Mm. I didn't realize that what I was seeing was was literally, you know, over 10 years old at that point. And um, it was a big shock to me when I actually figured that out because I was like, <laughs> now where am I going to go? Now who am I going to work for? Um, but yeah, it was it was definitely a defining sort of characteristic of my childhood. And it, it stayed true and has remained true since then. When was the first time you went to Disneyland? So that's the that's the kind of the funny thing is my parents never took us to Disneyland. Okay, we never went. I never got to go. I so got you to just see it. Through fantasize this. about yeah, it. Yeah, I would just fantasize. Okay. I would have these pictures about what it was like. And um, finally, when I was a teenager, my dad relocated our family to Southern California. Okay, and I was willing to give up every friend I had and everything I had in Utah to be near Disneyland. Sure. I was like, I'm gonna go to Disneyland. Sure. <laughs> So I finally got my first trip to Disneyland in in uh, early mid eighties, like early mm-hmm. to mid eighties, and uh, it began a love like it sort of just like reinforced things. Like now all of a sudden I could see these creations, I could see these buildings, I could see this sailing ship, I could see things, things that you've learned about now for years. Yeah, and that I'd heard like how they approached designing yeah. it, how they went about building it. Um, I got to you know see the creations of some of these personalities I'd heard about because I kind of was starting to learn who the people were, like who the crew was below right. Walt that was doing this. And I finally got to see it all. And it was like, I mean, it was like a like a addiction kicking in, like, yeah. like into overtime. It was like graduating from like a starter addiction to like the full blown, like you can't get out of this addiction. Yep. Um, now, some of the people behind the curtain, uh, I would took me years to even realize that there was a name for them, right? The Imagineers. And right. when I was having a conversation with a friend of mine, and I, I brought up that, you know, Walt had his Imagineers. They're like, they had never even heard of that concept. So explain to those who are listening, what is an Imagineer? Where did it start? And what are they today? What are they today? Yeah, they, um, it really kind of started back in the 50s. So an Imagineer is, an, is and this is my interpretation. So sure. this isn't a, a, a sort of blessed definition, but an Imagineer is an employee that works for Disney, whose job it is to look at the world and kind of take in everything that's available and look at experiences that have been, you know, desired to be created and marry art, technology, and show Mm -hmm. together to deliver an experience. They are the people who have to pull that all together. And they originally came about um, really kind of from the film industry, because when Walt Disney started building his park that he had dreamed about for a long time, he started building this park. He went, you know, it was really rapid. Uh, he got funding and in 52, 53, he sold, he mortgaged his house. He leveraged his life insurance policy. He did all kinds of stuff to get some money to work with on the side while Disney Studios was doing their thing. And his brother Roy was saying, no, you can't steal right. the money from the studio. Right. You have to do this separately. Um so he was kind of doing this, and he and he started this park, got the funding, got the land, kind of got the go ahead, got Bank of America, got um, ABC to participate in it. And that's how he finally got the funding 
built the park in a year. So they started in August of 1954. Which they, is insane. Yeah. They yeah. opened it in July of 1955. Mm-hmm. One year. Because like, mm-hmm. less than a year. Um, and it, you know... There are stories about how rocky that start was. Right, that but, opening day. I've seen I've seen a lot of documentaries on that opening day. Yeah, but they did it. Um, and one of the things that made it successful right off the bat was Imagineers and this this way of applying these different crafts, these trades, and these ways of looking at the world to it. And how Imagineers started is he started pulling people from the film industry mm-hmm. who knew set design and mm-hmm. knew set, you know, like set um, placement and background painting and how to create a shot and how yep. to... And he actually gave those people the lead on putting together what Disneyland would look like. Uh, and he pulled in animators who were really good at gags. You know, mm-hmm. like if you kind of think about cartoons that were made back in those days, they were just gag after gag after gag, right? right. And like that was the thing. So he bring those people over. And if you ever ride Pirates of the Caribbean, you can see Mark Davis's influence. And it's just a long run of gags strung yep. together in this cool story yep. built the Imagineer way. And that's why you have that experience. So um, they really created a whole new art form of this, you know, this idea of pulling, you know, from technology, latest tech you can get your hands on and latest, you know, art you had of iWorks, you know, using the first sodium screen techniques to do, you know, cut-ins and, yep. and do things like that. And, um, you know, these guys were pulling all these things together and they were doing it under the leadership of a guy that said, um, I'm just going to focus on the big vision. I'm not going to tell you how to do your thing. You're smart people. You're mm-hmm. going to figure out how to do it, but go do it. Start now. This is what the vision I want is. Right. And when I started learning more about how that impacted the business. I was like, that's who I want to be. That's mm-hmm. that's who I want to be as a business leader. That's who I want to be as a professional. That's I don't care if I'm doing a tiny little thing or a big thing. That's how I want to be. You know, I want to be the guy who has persistence of vision. So that was another thing that I picked up along the way. I was like, well, you this idea of sharing your vision um, is hard to keep going. You have to have persistence. And that, I loved that Walt Disney took an old animation term the trick, you know, the the term that means the trick of the eye that lets pictures look like they're moving when you flash them in sequence. Mm-hmm. That's persistence of vision. Mm-hmm. And he sort of applied that to it also means having the persistence of your vision to make sure you kind of drive it across the top and, and get stuff done. So I know I'm kind of all over the place. I'm I'm trying to cram literally like 60 years of of experience the into history in, here. In, in in here. But it was transformational. It gave, it gave me something like my head would just swim thinking about Imagineers and how they would do their job. And I'd see a video uh, or a, mo- a, a clip on, on the television about how they traveled to Mexico to learn something about this culture so that when they built the ride that went with that, it was appropriate and uh-huh. it looked right. And I was just like, that is, that is how you should do everything. Everything in the world should be built with that kind of right approach. Right, and you've met many Imagineers, is that right? Yeah, yeah. I've the one. Sadly, many of them are passing. Have passed, right? Um, but I have been able to meet quite a few, and um, I think you know. Are probably, there any original Imagineers still alive? Yeah, there are. Yeah, um, you know, there's Raleigh Crump. Um, there is Bob Gurr. Um, you know, I'm sure I'm forgetting some guys, but um, there are definitely a few few out there, and I've met both of those guys and uh-huh. spent you know more than one occasion with them just listening to them. You know, I, I still remember, you know, before we had this lockdown, I was in LA area at lunch with Bob Gurr, just like getting his thoughts on Disney and star Wars. And it was, you know, it was really kind of interesting to hear um, his perspective. And um, those guys, they have so much to teach you if you'll listen. And that's what I realized is these guys were just gems. So I've really made it a focus to get in touch with, and talk to as many of them as I can. So how did you get access to them, though? Because I don't think anyone can just look up their email and, and go schedule a lunch with these guys. So yeah. how did you build this relationship and get in touch with these people? So I start. I started with all the regular things. I mm-hmm. went to the conventions. I went to the private dinners that really you, know, you could you could sign up to be part of and fund a certain project. And oh, by the way, if you fund this project this guy's going to be there, you know, talking that night. And so I went to all of like any of those I could go to so that I could make the connections with these people. And then those connections led to other connections. And 
what I found is they're really open to making friends and discussing mm. how they looked at the world. Um, the thing I had with Bob Gurr is I approached him at the first time I ever met him at a dinner and I said, you're a car designer. And he was like, how do you know that? And I was like, cause I know that's what you were doing before you were an Imagineer. Tell me about car design. And, and you know, he was just like going off, you know, and talking about how he wanted to be, he'd gone to school and he wanted to work for GM and he wanted to design the Corvette body yep. and they didn't let him. And he ended up, you know, ejecting out of there. And, um, then he makes the Autopia car that looks a lot like a Corvette of yeah. that time, yeah. you know? And so, you know, and I got to hear all those stories, but it just became this foothold for us to maximize. And that's kind of been how all of them are, you know, Floyd Norman, not an, not, not a park Imagineer, but a very prestigious animator from Disney's history. Same thing. I just saw him, I saw him at this event at, at Walt's train barn in Southern California. And, uh, I just walked up to him and said, you did this work on Jungle Book. And you did this work over here. And he was like, oh, how are you? You know, mm -hmm. and so, you know, now we're, you know, we, now we talk to each other on Facebook Messenger about once a week, you know. And that's cool. And he just turned 80. And I'm worried that he's not going to, like, I'm yeah. worried, like, I don't, know, I don't know how much longer we'll have him. Yeah. Uh, so I'm just trying to, as much as possible, suck from these guys as much experience and things they're willing to share as possible because I, I, I model myself after those approaches. Yeah. Well, and one thing that you have brought up that I had not thought of before, but these guys are multidisciplinary professionals and it, it does kind of pattern your career journey as well. Right. They, yeah. they started in cars and maybe they got into now building theme park rides. Right. And that wasn't where they thought they were going, but that was the journey that they ended up on and they're able to take those, those crafts, those principles and now apply them to somebody else's vision and uh, and make what is arguably the best theme park that's ever existed on the face of the earth, you know? And it's funny because my wife and I, here's actually a, a sad story. My wife and I took our kids to Legoland. And I will tell you this, you couldn't pay me to go back there again because these theme parks are not the same. And we actually did Disneyland for a day and then we traveled down to Southern California and we went and visited some family. And so we also went to Legoland for a day. And they're not the same experiences. There's, there's a, something missing. Have you ever experienced that? Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Have you visited Legoland? So I've I visited a lot of places. What's the soul that's missing? How do you how do you explain that? Well, so it's actually probably the core thing I look at, and why it's so attractive to me. What Imagineers do, and what I want to do as a product leader, mm -hmm. which is. I love that there is an attention to detail. I love that there is no part of the experience that they don't think is worth considering. Yeah. Um, and that's what you miss. So when you go to a Legoland or you go to any other place, um, Universal is getting a lot better. I will say Universal has really been stepping it up. Uh, if you go to Harry Potter World, you will see. Yeah, the Islands of Adventure. And yeah. the, yep. I You'll agree. see attention to detail. I agree. Um, but I don't think any. I don't think to date. I don't think um, anybody has matched the Disney company, the the WDI, Walt Disney Incorporated. Um, I don't think you have seen the level of attention to detail matched anywhere else. And what I appreciate is that same philosophy of, can apply to anything. It can apply to software. It can apply to you know you working on your home and and you know doing a, 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 some improvements. It can apply to anything you want to do if you kind of have that philosophy that no detail is sort of not worth the investment to make sure it's the right mm -hmm. thing um it's amazing what happens right so what that means in a park is the transition spaces yep where you know in some place else that might just be a walkway maybe some grass maybe some concrete maybe a few trees um an Imagineer would never settle for that. An Imagineer would get down and look at that walkway from one direction and look where it was going, and then they'd go to the other end of it and look where it, where it, where it had come from, and it would make sure. And he, that person, he or she, would make sure that what you saw when you were on the walkway matched the theme of where you were going, mm -hmm. no matter which direction you were going, and that it felt right and it felt like you were easing into the scene. Mm -hmm. This is where the film industry was so important to. This is they looked at every every aspect of the park as if it was a scene in a movie. And so they 
back up. And, and there's look. unlimited angles. Then. Yeah. And yeah. They, so they've got to, they've got a they've they've got all these things that they have to do. And everybody's heard the stories about the forced perspective that they apply in the architecture and things like that. But so much more, so much more goes into what they're doing there to make you feel that immersion, to make you feel that attention to detail. So let me ask you this, because if you're not going to, you know, if if you're going to go with the quote unquote, uh, no stone left unturned kind of mentality and like everything's been designed, how do you keep then from designing forever? You know, how do you ship? How does Disney get Disneyland out in a year when they're paying attention to all those details? Well, how do you... Where do you marry those two ideas? Yeah, I think that's the great question, right? That, so there have been a lot of people that have approached projects, construction, park creation, software with the same sort of like onus. Like, I am going to do it this way. Mm-hmm. And two years later, you talk to them and they're still not done. Mm-hmm. They still haven't shipped something or you know they're still sort of iterating on a thing. And that was where persistence of vision becomes important to me is because what Walt thought his job was to Disney was to make sure everybody got to the destination. So what, what he would do is he'd, he'd invest a lot of himself. He would go through the projects that the Imagineers were working on when they were, had gone home for the night Mm -hmm. just to like get familiar with where they were and kind of see maybe they're struggling with this. Maybe they're struggling with that. But then he would kind of come back, and his input was always keep painting the big vision, keep trusting that those people can get there, and keep giving them the you know the the feedback that would guide them into paths that could complete. Yeah. Um, and you know sometimes he was also the guy that would say, "Start over. Like we're not going to get there with that approach. And I know it sucks, but start over. Like we're going to start this one over." And that's it's that's crazy that he had that veto power though, and still. And still complete it by these deadlines that they were setting for themselves. Like you can't start over too many times and still hit your deadlines. Right. That's in so that's where some magic is. And that's yeah. where it's 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 difficult to understand exactly how to replicate what he created because because of his belief in his people, because of how much he put to them to make happen right, it resulted in them reciprocating with like an unfathomable love and desire to yeah. to do what he needed to do. Mm-hmm. And that's that's really tough. Like that's right. hard to replicate. And you know, these are the same guys. I have sat next to an imagineer that is telling me a story and starts crying in the story when it got to the parties talking about Walt. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, that's amazing. And you like you get goosebumps and you're mm-hmm. like, man, that must have been amazing to work with a guy like that. And uh I think that's really what the secret was because I don't think they had magical powers. I think they 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 were so interested in getting to the vision that he was laying out there that they um that they they made the right calls, they would cut things, they would, you know, choose to do the right, you know, the right reworking but not rework here um if that was necessary. So they really had this this really agile mentality um, that you kind of see show up all over the place. The other thing that is interesting, and this is where if you talk to a guy like Bob Gurr, and you say to Bob, hey, Bob, what's your what's your approach to project management? He will say, don't do it. Don't worry about project <laughs> management. That's not how you do it. He's like, if you're having meetings to discuss project management, you're already behind. Mm. His His approach was start doing start moving down the road, start putting something together, start understanding how it was going to work. Because if you do that, you are much more informed about what you need to solve for as you go, as opposed to trying to outthink every problem that's going to come up. Do you think that's something that you value now as a business leader yourself? Absolutely. Yeah. I also realize not everybody's cut out for that way of thinking. I do oh, think- Oh, sure. Some I people do th- need the direction. They need the meeting. Yeah. I do. Th- I, I have definitely seen where I've leaned too far on the, hey, just start running. Mm. This is kind of where we want to end up. Let's see where you get to. Um, some folks in that, you know, kind of going, uh, that's that's not how I do it. Like, I, that doesn't work for me. So yeah. that, that's the other thing I realized is there was, there was another aspect of Disney that's like right people. Like- there was a people aspect. I was going to say, so do you think Walt was grooming the people, or do you think he got the people that he knew would fit this mold? It was it was, uh, it was, was a little bit of both. 
in every one of those people, what you find, if you really trace them back, is you find someone that he connected with at a very young age when he recognized certain abilities to them. And they will all have these stories. They all will say, I was just doing this thing. And Walt came in and said, well, you're going to do this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they will say, like, I had no inkling that I could ever be that kind of a person. Uh, but he told me I was going to be. And then that was the journey I was on. And so yeah. most of the Imagineers, especially the originals, um, and actually even the current crop, you know, they've all, they're, they've all been people that showed great promise early and then were given the opportunities to build into what, what he needed them to be. You know, it's funny because a couple of things that you're saying, it'd be easy for people to take away going things like, uh, you know, if you don't like the pro where the product's heading, stop and start over. Like that's not the takeaway from this conversation. Right. The takeaway is not, um, just tell people what you want and then they'll go get it done. Like that's not the takeaway either, right? right? And so he, Walt had a way of facilitating. Maybe we, what we call the persistent vision. Uh, he had this way of facilitating the process in a way that it's hard to, as you said, replicate these results. It's hard to say, well, this is the lesson. But I mean, there's a lot of people that idolize Walt, and they're trying to find these takeaways. So I, I just don't know how to do that without hearing things like these stories. Yeah, I think you know, I think that man was a unique individual. And you trace him back to when he forged his birth date on a volunteer card to join the Red Cross in, you know, 19, when he was 16 years old, proclaiming to be 17 so he could join the Red Cross and go to France and help with World War One. Like he was doing this sort of thing then as a teenager, like he was, you know, helping people get to just the right view and kind of helping people understand that they could do this. Like he had all sorts of schemes going when he was over at the uh, the, uh, was it new Chateau, uh, hospital emplacement mm -hmm. in France. Um, he actually got there after the war was officially concluded. So he kind of got to have some, some really interesting experiences. Um, but you see evidence of him being able to get people to catch his vision, yeah. get people to adopt it and then get people to act on their own toward it. Mm -hmm. And I really think that's sort of like one of the keys um, I think the other part to him was he always was good at at sort of like reading the tea leaves and seeing where it was. Like as people were working and people were driving toward their goals, he could not afford restarts. He could not afford, you know, and, you know, there was there was a lot um, riding on a lot of the calls he made. He was always leveraged to the hilt yeah. to do something. And so times when he would say, let's start over. Those came at great, great Calculated. cost. Yeah. yeah. And so he was always good at sort of reading where something was and figuring out, is it going to get to the right spot or is it not? Yeah. And then, and but what he didn't do is he didn't swoop in and crush people. He came back in and he would say things like, I don't know that that's going to get where we're going. Have you ever thought about maybe looking at it this way? Mm-hmm. And, you know, when you hear a lot of the memoirs, you know, from some of the Imagineers, they'll be like, that was exactly what I needed. It was just him to say, have you ever thought about looking at it this way? Then it was back on my shoulders, back on me to get there. But all of a sudden I found the path that mm -hmm. opened up. And so mm -hmm. what he was really good at was just kind of surgically coming in there and finding that person that was a little stuck and who had a big responsibility on their on their shoulders and saying maybe a different thought is what you need and giving them the push that direction. But then he would kind of back off and say, okay, you know, go from here. Do you think Walt benefited from having people like his brother Roy around or the Imagineers? I mean, do you think that there was that that was balance or do you think the people around him slowed him down? Like how do you how was that dynamic? So Roy was the guy who made everything possible. So Walt was the guy who could do it. He was the dreamer. Yeah, but none of it would have happened had it not been for Roy. Right. Roy was the guy where even when they were teenagers and Walt wanted to get this job where you get on a train and you sell snacks to people traveling on, traveling on a train. Uh -huh. Well, you have to buy all the snacks. Like You invest in all the inventory and then you go sell it. Roy is the guy who takes all the money he has and gives it, loans it to Walt to build up his snack inventory. So he can get on this train. Walt gets on the train, 
basically gives away all the snacks because he just wants to talk to people and wants and he's just so into trains he can ride the train and you know ride takes it on the chin um you know never gets his loan paid back i think eventually they settled up with what roy ended up with but you know he was always that guy that was kind of there going okay if that's your dream i'm gonna do all the real world things that have to happen to make sure you're you can you can actually do that and that's what yeah that's what was amazing about their partnership when he finally did start believing in Disneyland, he was the one that closed most of the funding. Right. You know, he was the one that got that to happen. Was um, Roy the older brother? Yeah. Okay, he was. How what was the age difference? Um, gosh, I can't remember the age difference. They're closer. There are two older brothers that are quite a bit older and an I older sister. That. I didn't know that. Um, but Roy and 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 Walt are the cl- the closest brothers. You know, or Roy's the closest to Walt. And then there's a sister um, and then yeah. Ruth. You know, I, I remember from watching some of those documentaries that uh, after Walt passed and Roy kind of stood in there that you started to see the dynamic of like Roy would help facilitate Walt's dreams. And now we lost the dreamer and we kind of had these awkward years right there. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, my thought was is that they benefited from each other. I don't know if Walt could have done the things that he did without Roy. Could he have? No, he really couldn't have. He... And it's kind of funny. Walt was always the guy that said, I have no need of money, mm-hmm. but I need money. <laughs> like, and so um, he was the guy like, like money to him was a necessary evil that was in the way of his dream. Yeah. He looked at every film that they, so, so I'll take you to 1938. Snow White comes out most successful film launch, you know, in a long, long time. They made so much money. And this is after two years of all of Hollywood telling him you're, it's going to be a failure. They called it Walt's Folly. Like mm-hmm. this, you're investing in a full length animation film. To that point, animation had only been like shorts right. and commercials, like ads. And this was the first full length animation animated film. And Walt had set the bar so high in his attention to detail. You know, he'd brought in character artists. He'd made sure that the animals were and were were uh, animated correctly. He'd made sure. The background paintings were art pieces of themselves. Yep. And so, you know, here's the whole world going, you are going to fail. Here's him and Roy going, we're going to not be able to pay payroll here shortly. Mm-hmm. And Walt's not letting off the dream. Like, yeah. no. And so, Walt, you know, Roy's mortgaging things, you know, Walt's selling his car, and like they're doing all kinds of stuff. Well, the premiere happens at Carthay Circle. Most, one of the most, or you know, one of the most successful launches um, of a film ever, and all Walt can think to do afterwards is spend every dime they make from the movie to build a bigger studio to do more things and to do more. Like, and that's like literally, he just Free sunk invest. all the money right back yep. in, right? And so, Roy had to be there, or I'm pretty sure like Walt would have been, you know, a popper somewhere. Yeah. No, that's really interesting. You know, I, we're running short on time, but I do have two questions here I, I want to ask you before we we uh, end this. Uh, in my mind, I envision Walt as curious. Like, if I'm trying to, I'm trying to put like a trait to him. Like, obviously, we'll we'll say dreamer, but I feel that's like kind of cliche when we talk about Walt. Can you put your finger on a trait that Walt exemplified, and you think that we can still apply today to? tap into that yeah um and it's easy because you just said the word he was a curious person was a curiosity he never he never let a barrier stop him from learning about something he never um if you go to 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 disneyland and you go into the enchanted tiki room and you see Mm -hmm. all the birds Mm singing that exists because he got a gift of this little air operated mechanical bird Mm -hmm. uh that he was like I'm so curious about how this works. And so he gets this amazing gift, came from, I think it was France or somewhere. And the only thing he can think to do is have it taken apart so he can look at every single part so he can figure out if there's something they could use out of it. And and then that's what led way to animatronics. That's where that started is that that thinking. So he just insanely curious, never – there was never a topic that he wouldn't want to go understand more about. I love that. I think that's totally applicable to anyone in product. You know, obviously this podcast is is more geared for UX designers that are, you know, getting their career 
uh, up and, and running. And I think that that inclining for curiosity is something that can't be understated. Uh, you know, those who are naturally curious and not necessarily driven by the finish line, but driven by the journey, I think end up having a lot of success. Yeah. Uh, the last question I wanted to ask you is now we flash forward to today's 2020. Uh, there are still Imagineers. Uh, they, they're, in fact, I believe that there's quite a few titles at Disney now that are all Imagineering-esque titles. Um, but if we looked outside of Disney, do you see anyone in this world today that personifies some of those characteristics of Walt? Do we have a modern-day Walt? Is there somebody that these 9- and 10-year-olds are looking up to as a Walt? You know, it's that's a great question because it's actually hard for me to spot them. Mm-hmm. I, think, I, think they, I think they are out there. Um, they're just not maybe doing the type of thing that you might equate with what he did. So I look at somebody like Elon Musk, mm-hmm. and I'm like, yeah, that's a modern-day Walt. Mm-hmm. Completely different set of things he's yep. focused on. But the things that drive him, you know, when you see the smile on his face when he's out there watching a rocket launch, like, you know <laughs> that you're dealing with a guy that is just, like, insanely curious about all the things that he could do in the world. And, yep. I, th- and I, I do think they're rare. I do think they're not everywhere. Um, but I do think they, I do think they are out there. Yeah. Did you see the meme? It said something like, uh, ladies find a man that looks at you the way Elon Musk looks at his rockets. (laughs) (laughs) Cause there's the picture of, uh, the most recent, uh, launch that they had and he's just got tears coming down his face. (laughs) Well, you know, the saying was always said about, Walt. Walt built Disneyland. So he would have the toy he wanted. Mm Mm-hmm. Elon Musk built a rocket yeah. so he could have the toy he wanted. Yeah. Like, I think there's a really strong well, it, correlation. And I love it because e- I, Elon's a person that I would have said. Obviously, they do business very differently. They've got very different personalities. Yep. Uh, just from what I've obviously been able to pick up, don't know them, obviously. But from what I've been able to pick up on, they've got different personalities. But you're you're right. I do think they've got that, that curiosity trait uh, and just that love for what they do. I mean, when you look at Elon Musk doing things from tunnels to spaceships to cars, to the wall, to why? Okay. And everything in between, yeah. uh, flamethrowers, right? What was the purpose of that? Curious. Wanted to know how they worked. Yeah. <laughs> and I go, it's, it's a cool trait to have. And I think it's, it's fun that you, uh, you called out that one. Adam, I, we're out of time. Uh, but this has been an incredibly fascinating conversation. I've just been grinning ear to ear the entire conversation. Um, I know there are obviously people going to be listening to this and they want to know how can I reach out to Adam? How can I connect with him? Uh, what's the best way for them to do that? Uh, I'm on LinkedIn. Okay. I'm Adam Landefeld. Um, I, I definitely am trying to do a lot better about responding. LinkedIn has never been a preferred communication platform for, for me, but I've realized the world has used it a lot. And yeah. so I'm starting to do better there. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm there. Okay. And we did not share this and if this has to get edited out in, in, in post, we can do that. But the whole reason you've been with these Imagineers and the whole reason you've been studying about, you've also been documenting this, haven't you? Yeah. And what's the plan with what you've been documenting? Yeah. So I've been um, so fascinated with what resulted in what I believe to be one of the most creative endeavors that has ever been undertaken, which is the Disneyland park. Mm -hmm. Um, And I um, have been taking all of this knowledge. I've been, it, it just kind of been stewing in my head and there's sort of, there's the, application aspect of it where I'm trying to use it to become a better product leader. Yep. Trying to take, you know, pull learnings out and become a better product leader. But the other part is I'm taking all that knowledge and trying to create um, historical fiction novels. Um, and I have a series that I'm working on and I'm, I'm for the, through the first three installments of that. Um, first one is that is in editing right now. And I have no idea if I'll ever get to publish it or anything else like that, but it's really fun to kind of, pull all of that knowledge together into then something I can output, something yeah. I can do that like represents my, almost like a memorial to it. If yeah. You know, like, um, so that's kind of, that's, that's the little, the journey I'm on right now. Absolutely. So it's in editing the first, is the first uh, series or the first, first novel novel is yeah. in editing right now. What's the chances it sees the light of day? So it really depends on whether I'm just okay getting it out there or okay. whether I think or I could make any money off it um, because I could self-publish it now. Yep. And um, I've talked to some publishers about those paths and they're like, oh, no, 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 don't self-publish. If it's any good, 
Like you will just kill yourself if you self publish. Well, and how many people have done the work to interview as many of the Imagineers? I mean, is there a lot of? Oh yeah, is there a lot of people that have done that work? Yeah, a lot of people. There's. I'm not okay. unique in that, and there are a lot of people where I'm completely unique. I think is in my what I'm trying to do with the all the knowledge is create new stories yeah. where they are documentary. Yeah, and so I think it's fun to take people on a journey cool. to kind of shine a light a different way. Cool. Well, I appreciate, again, everything that you shared. This has been an awesome episode. Uh, I don't have any final words. Thanks, everyone, for listening. It's been a, uh, another episode of Design Today. I'll see you next time. Adam, that is so fascinating.